Dan Roberts. He wouldn't be here today if we didn't have Bobby because he likes copy. Dan uh, also works at Automatic. He's been there three years, four years. So Dan's going to tell us all about CSS Grid. Welcome, Dan. CSS Grid Layout is a specification that introduces a two-directional grid system to CSS. Grids can be used to lay out major page areas or small interface elements. You can do this without the need for a CSS framework um, or any of the positioning tools or floating hacks that we needed to rely on. So the idea behind a grid is that you take an element on your page and you set it as a grid container. So like the white area right here would be the grid container. And then you slice up that element and you, um, you can take all the grid items once it's sliced up and you can place them anywhere on, on using the grid areas that you define. So much like Flexbox, the whole concept behind CSS Grid is about the relationship between the container and the items. When you set an element to display grid, all of the child items automatically become grid items. Um, so there's no actual like, display grid item property or anything like that. It's all about displaying that definition on the container first. So I'm going to begin by walking through some key terms and concepts, um, and then we'll get into a couple actual examples. First couple of terms we've already touched on, but I'll just come, cover them over um, you know, quickly just to stick with all the rest of the other, other terms. So grid container is what we've already talked about. It's all of it. A grid item will be any item that's a direct child of a container. The vertical and horizontal lines that divide the grid and separate the columns and rows are called the grid lines. They're numbered left to right and top to bottom. They also respect your language direction. So if you're coming from a right to left language, um, it will over right to left. Um, and so, oh, also one good key point is that grid columns and rows, um, they're not numbered by the actual column or row itself. You always have one more because it's actually numbered by the grid lines. So here you have four, but you notice you have five grid lines. And that's what, when you start, later on when we start positioning items, you'll notice that um, we actually go by the grid lines. So the space between two grid lines are referred to as grid tracks. And they're just really another word for columns or rows. Um, the vertical are uh, the vertical ones are grid columns, and the horizontal tracks are grid rows. The space between the rows and the columns in a grid are referred to as the grid gutter or the grid gap. Um, you create you can create space in your grid by creating gutters, and they're similar to margins. Grid area is the rectangular space surrounded by four grid lines. The grid area can contain any number of grid items. So here I'm giving four grid items, but it could be two, it could be one. So understanding how implicit and explicit grid tracks work is a part of the fundamental understanding of CSS grid. If you do not explicitly define a track, it will be implicit. Um, that means that the browser will automatically fill in the remaining items that don't fill into the defined tracks. So let's consider this markup. And then our styles here, we have explicitly defined four columns by 200 pixels. If we did not define them, we'd have one column and it would just be stacked on top of each other to take up the whole the whole 100 percent the width of the container. Um, once we define the columns, <coughs> once they're filled, the browser needs to put the remaining items somewhere. So here we define four columns, um, and so you have four items. And once those items are placed, there's four more, and it needs to put it somewhere else. So we'll implicitly loop it down and set them in as a row, but it'll respect the column definitions. So we have four explicitly defined columns, but we have two implicitly defined rows because we haven't defined any rows at 
Um, similarly, if we do define a set of rows, so if we use grid template row up here and we did define some rows, and there are more items that fit in to the amount of rows, they would again loop down below and be explicit to find rows. So let's quickly go over some of the properties um, that I'll be using in some of the examples. I'm not going to cover all of the properties in the specification, but um, I think it would be helpful to just cover some of them first. <coughs> grid template columns and grid template rows define the line names and track sizing functions of the grid columns and rows, respectively. In short, these rules are used to explicitly define our rows or columns like we saw in the previous Grid auto columns and grid auto rows specify the size of an implicitly created column and row, respectively. So here, we're defining all of our columns that are were implicitly created to be 200 pixels wide and 200 pixels tall. So that will create uh, each element that fills in after will take on those dimensions. Grid row gap and grid column gap specifies the size of the grid lines, setting the width of the gutters between the columns and rows. And this is just a shorthand grid gap, which you saw earlier on, this is a shorthand for the grid column gap and grid row gap. Grid template areas defines a grid template by referencing the named grid areas that are specified in the grid area property. I'm just kind of glossing over this one here because we're going to cover it more in an example, but just mentioning this. Grid column start and grid column end specify a grid item start and end position respectively. Here we're setting the element with the class item one. Uh, it should cover two columns in width. Because again, back to the rows, um, that will, there will be two columns and then three grid lines. So you use the grid lines uh, instead of the actual columns. In grid columns, the shorthand property for the two, where the first value is the start position, and the second value is the end position. Grid row start and grid row end specify grid items start and end position, respectively. Building off the previous example, we're now setting the element class item one to span over, uh, that would be three rows high. So this will be two rows wide, three, three rows high. Grid row is a shorthand property for the two, where the first value is the start position, and the second is, is the end position, same as grid column. So now that we've touched on what CSS grid is, and we've covered some key concepts and terms, let's go over a basic example to see it in that. Here's the markup we'll be using. Not, nothing special, just a div container with some child elements that are divs. Um, note that the markup doesn't have to be written this way. Um, I'm just doing so for the sake of simplicity. You can use non order list, really anything that gets um, display grid, it automatically sets the children to items. So it's not really relying on your markup. So here in our styles, we're setting the outer element as um, the grid container by using display grid. As I mentioned previously, they're just going to stack on top of each other. Not that impressive just yet. That's because simply setting display grid um, doesn't really do that much in and of itself. You still need to slice up the container in columns or rows. So let's do that. Here we've set up four columns of 200 pixels wide and two rows of 200 pixels height explicitly. We've also set a grid gap of 15, uh, 15 the result's much better, and it's not too bad for just four lines of CSS. There's still room for improvement, though. For example, what if we want the grid items to fill up all of the space? Along with CSS grid comes some really handy uh, units and notations. The FR unit and the repeat function. The FR unit is a, u a new unit of length, which is short for fraction or fractional unit. MDN defines it as a unit which represents a fraction of the available space in the grid container. 
that's important, the available space part is key. In this example, we've rewritten the grid template columns to use FR instead of absolute pixel points. We can improve on this further with the repeat notation. Instead of repeating the same value over and over, we're now wrapping the value in repeat. The second argument of repeat is the value that you want to repeat it. Well, the first argument is the number of times you want to repeat it. This allows a recurring pattern to be written more uh, in more compact form. The result is the same as the long version. And now that we've placed the pixel values of a more flexible FR unit, we see that the grid items now take up a full width of the container. So what's happening here is the FR units are telling the grid to fill in all of the available space with four evenly spaced columns because we're using four and it's the same, it's repeating the same unit, so they're all going to be the same. But you don't have to stick with one unit of measurement. You can, for example, mix pixels with the FR unit, like you see here. This can be handy if you want to have a part of your grid take up a set amount of space, and then the rest of the grid to kind of stretch around it and fill in the rest of the space. And that's kind of where I was talking about a minute ago, where um, the, filling the available space, that's what, that's key when you're mixing units. Um, so the way this is calculated is that the pixel values are calculated first, and then the rest of the space is given to the FR units. Another way to look at it is to think of FR as free space, and then think of like an absolute value with pixel as paid space. <coughs> so we've covered some basics. Let's start placing some of our lines or our items on the grid using grid lines. So by default, as you've seen, um, each of the grid items will be placed automatically in the default order. We want to customize a grid beyond that default layout order. Um, we can position items using grid lines. So using pretty much the same container markup, I added number nine. Um, but other than that, it's the same container markup as, as our previous examples. Um, we can start to target individual grid items for fine grain control over a more complex layout. So here we're setting the specific start and end positions for grid item number one to span across two columns and two rows. So you're seeing the grid column start and grid column end position. For number nine, I'm actually placing it in place of item six, where six would, you know, would default right here, and it shifts everything over by one. Um, so the items that we don't position will attempt to fill in and span the default height limit. Here's the same code from the previous slide, um, and just the shorthand property, which I like to use a lot more. Um, so each, each item represents the starting point and the end point. But we're not limited to positioning items via line numbers. We can also use uh, named grid areas with the grid template areas and grid area properties. That's what I kind of glossed over a couple slides ago when we were covering terminology. Here's a basic page layout that we're kind of going for here. And here's a markup that represents that page layout, the header, sidebar, content, footer. So this block of CSS is pretty similar to the code in our previous examples, the main exception being the grid template areas property. Okay. So repeating the uh, same item, or sorry, instead of replacing each grid item individually, we can define the entire layout with this property and then assign the different areas to each item using the grid area property. So when you repeat the name, the area causes the grid item to span across those rows or columns. The number of area names you list out as rows and columns is based on the number of rows and columns defined in that container. So you can look at this definition and visualize it as the actual grid. So for example, we have two rows or two columns that we define here and you have two columns here, and then you have three rows, and you have three rows down here. The header will span across, the footer will span across, and then the sidebar and the content will split. And since I'm mixing units, I have 200 pixels, and one FR will have the same effect from the previous examples where we had the two columns that were 200 pixels. Um, the sidebar will be locked in at 200, and the content will span 
and you get the same result that we expected. So let's talk about dev tools. CSS Grid is hard to visualize because it's made up of columns, rows, um, tracks, and gaps, which aren't actually elements in and of themselves. Dev tools are helpful to visualize what's going on. Well, Chrome dev tools are pretty good. They're getting better. Um, I still think the best option we have right now are Firefox Developer, or the, the dev tools from Firefox Developer Edition. So the dev tools in Firefox Developer Edition has a little layout panel. And um, it lists out all of the available CSS grid containers on the page. And it includes an overlay to help visualize the grid itself. You can choose what you want displayed on the overlay. And you can, that includes uh, grid line numbers, area names, and even the color of the line. When displaying the overlay, all of the lines represent something. For example, the solid line is the start and end of the explicit grid. Um, the dashed diagonal lines are the grid gap. I don't know if you can see that very clearly. And then the dark dashed lines represent an explicit track. We have defined columns, we have an explicit track here. And then the smaller, the lighter dotted lines, they represent an implicit track. There seem to be a couple common questions that I have as I heard people talk about CSS grid. I think the main question is when should you use grid versus flexbox? So I'm not going to cover this extensively, but I do want to touch on the main difference between the two specifications. And that is flexbox takes on a one directional approach and gives the container element the ability to alter its items to best fill the available space. With flex, block, flex box, you control the additional flow, or you control the directional flow to be either rows or, or columns. CSS Grid, on the other hand, takes on a two-directional uh, approach, and it allows you to fill both the space uh, in, container, in the container's rows and columns. So while there's certainly some overlap in cases where you can use one or the other, there are definitely those situations where you want to go for one over the other. Another thing I've heard, I just heard this the other day, um, is that it kind of reminds me of HTML tables. And uh, your how is it any better or different than HTML tables? And I think it's a fair question, considering there's a lot of the terminology um, kind of overlap between the two, for common language. There are main reasons why you shouldn't use HTML tables for layouts and why CSS Grid is different. HTML tables, for one, were designed for tabular data. Early on, people used them as a layout hack because browser support for CSS across different browsers was really poor. Using table for layout also reduces accessibility for visually impaired users. The output from screen readers tends to be uh, confused by the complicated markup that you get in tables. Also, because the markup is complicated in tables, uh, it tends to be more difficult to debug and maintain. Lastly, tables are not automatically responsive, so proper layout containers, or proper layout, um, the, the containers will expand to 100% of the width of the parent element by default. Tables, on the other hand, are sized according to the content by default. So because of this, there are extra measures needed when you um, use a table-based layout to work across devices. Speaking of responsive, pairing CSS grid with media queries allows us to make code adjustments to our layout with a small amount of code. This shows the flexibility of using CSS grid for our layouts as opposed to something like HTML tables. In this example, we're shifting elements, spanning, and positioning at each breakpoint. It's not necessarily like a real world example. I mean, it could be, but I'm really just using it to illustrate the flexibility of the specification. When we've retrieved the previous layout, it shifts with a small amount of code. On the screen here, it looks like a lot of code, 
really just like small amounts of code within each media query. There really isn't that much code at all, considering everything. So lastly, the question that's probably on everyone's mind is, can I actually use this today? Like, what's the browser support like? So with any new feature, I highly recommend that you study your analytics and determine what, if this will work for your user base. That said, browser support for the CSS grid is actually pretty good. So in addition, there are a couple of useful things to be aware of when considering fallbacks, if you do need them. So browsers ignore CSS that they don't understand. So if a browser that does support CSS grid, or actually doesn't support CSS grid, um, comes across a grid-specific property, it'll just ignore it and move on. With that, though, the new layout specification, um, it knows about the old layout specification. This is really cool because um, if an item is floated or uses the clear property, and then becomes a grid item, it no longer displays any floating or clearing behavior. So it makes it easy to create fallback when you need those. So between those two things, it can um, be fairly simple to create a fallback for an element that uses CSS grid. You just need to determine if it's worth the overhead based on the demographic data of your application. So I'm going to show a link to these slides, um, but where all these will actually be links to the resources that I'm sharing with you. Um, but just a couple things. Rachel Andrew and Jen Simmons are great people to follow, um, generally and specifically related to CSS Grid, and both of them were involved in the specification itself. Um, a Book of Heart, a new CSS layout, also by Rachel Andrew, is a great book. It's, um, it's really easy to read and digest, and it covers not only CSS Grid, but also goes into Flexbox, um, the way we used to do things, why we shifted, um, and it's a really short read to it. I'm almost done on the last chapter, and I read most of it on just a plane ride. Um, Wes Boss's video course on CSS Grid is great. It's free. Mozilla sponsored it. Um, so you can just go and watch it for free. I highly recommend that. Um, CSS, CSS Tricks always has um, they have good uh, kind of like guides. They have one for Flexbox, they have one for Grid. And then MDN is always great for Docs, and they have a great playground. And here's a link to my slides. Thank you, I'm Dan, and I work at Automat. We have plenty of time for questions, if anybody has any questions for Dan. Would this generally be used in the page layout, or would it be something that an AM user would play with too? So the question was, would this usually be used when laying out a page, or is it something that the end user would play with? Uh, like would be able to play around with. Um, well, this is for building, so this would be for the page layout. Um, the end user, either it's in the code, it's just the CSS, they wouldn't really see this directly other than the end result. So if you set a column width to like 200 pixels wide and four columns, um, I assume that sits to 11. Do you know if you can center those, or you just, would you have to make the container center within another container? Are you talking about centering the entire, like all of them? Yeah. Okay, so, yeah, and, and I, I didn't cover the whole specification, so there are, there are definitely things like you can justify your items individually, just like you can with Flexbox. Um, additionally, you can, there's a property I didn't even mention, but it, instead of saying display grid, you can also say display inline grid, which makes that container like an inline block element, okay. and you can center it that way too. Cool. Does that answer your question? Yep. Could you like do an FR uh, pixel and an FR that would affect the center as well? So like a 1 FR 150 pixel, uh, a 1 FR, would that center it? I think that would work actually, yeah. Okay. I'd have to try it, but yeah, I think that means it seems to make sense. <laughs> yeah, because the 200 pixels uh, would be the page space, right, and then each of it would span for the rest of the container, right? But yeah, I think so. Yeah, that would do it. Thanks, Thank Dan. You.